Lord, um, please help me and give me this thing. I want it tomorrow. I want it fast and I want it my way. Thank you very much. So hello everyone. I am Jordan Sigas, the Discord student leader for OCF, and I'm joined today by Father Tom Sakalakis, the priest at Holy Apostles uh, Greek Orthodox Church in Seattle, Washington, and family and marriage therapist. Uh, today we are going to be uh, interviewing Father Tom and discussing the Jesus Prayer. Uh, so before we begin, Father Tom, would you lead us in prayer? That's a great idea since the topic is prayer, right? <laughs> I like to stand up and I'll explain why. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Heavenly King, comfort of the Spirit of truth, you are everywhere present, Lord, and you fill all things, treasure your blessings and giver of life. Come and dwell in us and cleanse us and save our souls. Lord, we come before you asking for your mercy, for guidance, that we may learn about prayer, about becoming united with you, to know you, so we can know you and you can know us. May you guide us today in this short time to reveal some ideas and ways of practices to come closer to you through prayer. I mean, I mean, uh, uh -huh. recently uh, I read the the book, The Way of a Pilgrim, which focuses a lot on the Jesus prayer as a form of unceasing prayer that's prayed in the heart. Uh, however, the pilgrim in the story is praying and focusing on prayer and solitude for most of the story. Uh, and in our busy and hurried lives as college students, this type of prayer uh, doesn't really seem to like match our lifestyle. How can we use the Jesus prayer in our busy lives as college students? I think you make a really good point. You know, not just the Jesus prayer. I think any kind of prayer is difficult in our lives. So I think I want to talk about really what we come to see as prayer. Hopefully uh, invite us to learn how to rethink about prayer and to practice prayer. So we're so busy in life, we're, we're so running and, and especially college students are got so much on your plate and you're constantly moving and you're constantly being filled in your mind. And really there's har hardly any room for anything else, let alone prayer, right? So we need to have prayer. We need to slow down so we can, so we can listen. So I think a lot of times I hear people in confession and in general talk about prayer being this, Lord, um, please help me and give me this thing I want it tomorrow, I want it fast, and I want it my way. Thank you very much. <laughs> I, I can't tell you how many times I hear prayer almost become like, you know, God's the butler and you're the master telling God what you want. And that's not quite what prayer is. In the dictionary, it's, it's, it says a request, a, a request for help, an expression of thanks for God, to God. And, and isn't that funny that uh, that kind of prayer it's not what I'm going to talk about, but that's inclusive in prayer, included in prayer. Isn't that funny? We we talk about those things when we have a tragedy or when somebody's sick or in 9-11, those of you that were around in 9-11, where people were on their knees begging for mercy when an earthquake happens in Turkey, people are turning to, towards God, towards prayer. So for me, I, I don't. it's not a transactional thing. I'm going to do this, Lord, so you can do that for me. Prayer is not a transaction. Prayer, as hopefully I'll try to unfold, is a relationship. It's 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 something that we were created our, in our DNA uh, was initiated prayer because Adam and Eve was in creation, really. Creation is praying. And prayer is, for me, uh, a communion and union with God, with one another, and with creation. Can you imagine that kind of life? And that's why we pray, because that's been distorted. When I thought about you asking me these ideas on prayer, and we'll get to the Jesus prayer. I thought, just what have I learned about prayer? And I got to tell you that, and maybe you guys got to think about that. Who inspired you to pray? Whoever's listening here, right? Think think for a while. Maybe write a few thoughts down of who inspired you to pray. And uh, let me ask you that question, Jordan. Who, If you think back on someone in your life, uh, who inspired you to pray? I think it's like definitely like varied over the time of my life like when I was a kid and growing up like prayer was something that was very like ingrained in like how we do like our daily life type things just for my parents like my parents taught us like hey we always pray before meals we come together and pray as a family at nighttime when we go to church we pray when we light candles we pray when we print red icons we pray so all of these things are things that are taught to me by my parents your most, most of us through my family. families and for me my, my mom was illiterate she didn't know much she didn't know the scriptures she didn't know doctrine but I think her life was a prayer. And I think I'll never forget 
every Saturday she'd be walking around the house with incense, offering her prayers before we go to church on, on Sunday. So Saturday night was a big thing. And she always, when I would see her, when I walked by her room, sometimes she'd be praying in her corner. And she'd have her Stefana, the, the crowns that she got married with, with the candles in the corner praying. So it's not the, that she taught me my, she taught me to pray. She, I mean, she told me to pray and I learned how to pray just watching. So it was one thing watching my, watching my mom. Uh, another thing was being in, uh, when I went to Ionian village, I, I went to uh, venerate the relics of St. Uh, Dionysios. If you, you don't know, St. Dionysius, he's got his, his uh, body there. It, it, the, 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 the Turks try to burn his body, so it's, it looks like it's charred, but he's there, full-bodied. And it's the first time I saw an experience of saints. So I just felt like I stepped into prayer, because when you think of St. Dionysius, you see a man who constantly lived prayer. And I think for me, he invited me to step into that sacred space without any words. I mean, people were praying around me. And then when everybody left, I, I just couldn't leave the room. And I, I think I was, there was a magnetic force. Just, I was there weeping. I don't know what I was weeping about, but I just was weeping. And I felt that was uh, an invitation to the sacred space of the heart to pray. And the other thing I, I thought of, and uh, when I thought about who inspired me, who impacted me is this incredible metropolitan who's in, um, He's in Athens now. He's a uh, uh, Nicholas Hudzi Nicolau, and he was a student at, at Cambridge and Harvard. And, and to make a long story short, um, when I was in Greece, he left everything back in America to become a monk, and we had him over for lunch. And I'll never forget, we sat down to pray, and I had George Winston, some music playing in the background, and, and we were sitting down, and he looks at me in a very kind way. He goes, Thanas, I wasn't a priest. He goes, Thanasi. Let's turn the music off. We're going to pray. And then we're sitting down. We're going to hold hands. He goes, Thanasi, I think we should stand up. And it's really important to stand up so you know to whom you're praying to. So from that day on, where anyone that comes to our house, we stand up for prayer because we're offering a prayer to God, the Almighty, who gives us the food to eat and the breath to breathe. So we, in, in a sense of honoring, we stand up. And uh, there's something about having the body be in a position of prayer. So um that's one thing for me that i learned prayer is so important it, it it gets me to get out of my head and into my heart and a good friend of mine george stavros he's professor george stavros uh, that he did research on uh, the jesus prayer he he did a study where he had people uh recite the jesus prayer for 10 minutes i don't know what the random age was but uh for 10 minutes for 30 days and the and then he had other people just go through the study and they they um, filled out this this inventory about how they feel depression anxiety and all that kind of stuff and how they feel about themselves the world and um, they found the people that did not pray stayed similar in the same way the people that did pray the Jesus prayer for for ten minutes in the Jesus prayer if some of you don't know is in many many variations Lord Jesus Christ Son of God have mercy on me and some people say. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And the word sinner is not that you're a bad person. The word sinner means that we're on this side of the kingdom and that we're not um, sinless. We can still be beautiful people and be sinners. The saints talked about themselves being sinners. So hold that in mind too. So Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me. So he found out that the people that, that offered that, that prayer for 10 minutes a day for 30 days uh, what happened is their blood pressure went down, anxiety went down. Some people talked about depression being less. They talked about having more energy. Uh, so for me, I, I I thought, whoa, you know. And and I remember I was I was part of that study, and I realized when you're disciplined and you do that, there's something that opens up in your heart and soul. So, um, so the whole idea of prayer for me, and we'll talk about the Jesus prayer in particular is I think a lot of times we don't know how to pray. And I, I think for you out there that maybe have never really prayed to consider it, I, I'd really like for you to take this time to, to dedicate yourselves from now, at least through Lent. How are you going to maybe carve out maybe 10 minutes is too much for you. Uh, maybe two minutes and you can build up. 
but this idea of not that it's going to be a transaction. Well, I'm going to do this because this is what I owe you, Lord. No, it's going to, you're going to do this because you know there's a real God in real life that wants to be connected with you, that wants to be in communion with you, that wants to love you, that wants to call you his beloved daughter or your beloved, his beloved son. This is what we do uh, when we pray is we offer ourselves to God so he can come into our lives so we can step into his. So for me, prayer is is non-negotiable. It's in the DNA of the human person. Kind of just reflecting a lot of like what my kind of prayer journey has been like and like what kind of what you're discussing. And it's very much so a similar vein because it was, I remember when I was first trying to introduce prayer into my life, it was kind of, it was definitely pretty hard at first, but it was just kind of like de- carving out those dedicated small times to what's achievable and kind of building from there. That was like really what kind of like was really helpful to me, I would say. And I really wanted to, to realize prayer is probably the most difficult thing you're going to do in your life. Because after the fall, the disconnect between the head and the heart was so severe that prayer, what prayer is really trying to do, you guys, here's a deal. I really believe with all my heart is trying to reconnect our head and our heart so we can live from the heart, from the inside out, not from the outside in. That, for me, is the greatest miracle about prayer, because so many of us are impacted by outside sources and defined by outside uh, definitions or people defining us whether we're smart or not short or fat uh, uh, ugly or cute or whatever you want to define it you know St. Paul talks about this right so we wonder wh- where is this idea of unceasing prayer I don't have time to pray people say it, and it's too much you know I don't know what to say and so in Thessalonians 1 Thessalonians 5 16 through 18 uh, St. Paul says rejoice always pray without ceasing Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. So he says, pray. He says, rejoice and pray without ceasing. And Theophon the recluse, who I'm going to quote again, he says also that somebody says, what, what is prayer, right? It's not, a, and it's not a contract. He's not your butler. He's, he's a person who wants to step into your life and become united with you. I don't know about you. I want you to want that with all your heart, you guys. And that's what prayer invites, that that desire and thirst to be united with God. So here's what Theophon the Reckless says. Prayer is to um, stand before God with the mind in the heart and go on standing before him unceasingly day and night till the end of life. And you think, how can I do that? I have, I have it exams i have studies i have you know I, I, i'm dating i I'm, I'm going out i'm i'm busy and and what he's saying to me is a remarkable non-negotiable thing the reality that god is with us even right here with you and me mm-hmm. jordan and we yeah. have that that reality we couldn't contain ourselves and we really understood that and that's why the saints were living like in another world because when you step into prayer you step into another kingdom you step into the kingdom that was created for us originally so prayer for me is really a way that I've come to know myself. And if you really want, you know, you can go to psychologists, you can go to me as a therapist or other people, and, and they'll help you a lot. But at the end of the day, if they're not helping you um, direct yourself inward to that holy space within, then, you know, you'll be okay. You'll be fine. But you'll miss the mark. The mark is being united with Christ. And that's what we hope through prayer. Here's what Theophon said also, that some of us, our prayers are like this. He goes, you got to get out of your head and into your heart. And he doesn't mean the feeling part of your heart. He doesn't mean um, the mushy, gushy stuff. He means the very center of who you are as a human being. You got to get out of your head and into your heart. He goes, right now, your thoughts are in your head and God seems to be outside of you. Your prayer and all your spiritual exercises also remain exterior. As long as you are in your head, you will never master your thoughts, which continue to whirl around your head like a bunch of mosquitoes on a summer's heat or drifting snow in a winter storm. And you know, you guys out there who are dealing with anxiety or depression, that's the very thing he's talking about. It's almost like you guys are, we're all hoarders, we're hoarders of thoughts. And they kind of swim in our heads. And there's no room to, to let Jesus come in, right? So he says, a bunch of mosquitoes on a summer's heat or drifting snow and winter storm. If you descend 
into your heart, you will have no more difficulties. Your mind will empty out and your thoughts will dissipate. Thoughts are always in your mind chasing one another about and you never and you will never manage to get them under control. But if you enter into your heart, you can remain there. Then every time your thoughts invade, you will only have to descend into your heart once again and your thoughts will vanish into thin air. This will be your safe haven. And I say to myself, don't be lazy. Don't be lazy. Descend and you will find your heart. You will find life in your heart and you will find life. So the Jesus prayer, when we practice that in your busy life, I like to encourage you to practice five minutes a day or right before you, an exam. You might think I don't have time and I'm thinking you don't have time not to. Just try it for, for Lent, knowing that you have a real God that wants to meet you in your prayer. So you become the prayer that you offer. You know, in, in the liturgy, we start off, you know, people get so bored in the liturgy. And I'm thinking, I, I get it because we're so disconnected from our head and our heart. If we're connected with our heart and the, the priest comes up with a Bible and says, blessed is the kingdom of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit now and ever to the ages of ages. We're saying something very dramatic. We're stepping into a sacred space. And you guys say, amen, yes, cool. I can't wait. And most of us say, okay, yeah, amen, whatever. And then the next thing we say is, in peace, let us pray to the Lord. And you say, what? Lord, have mercy, please. From the peace from above and the salvation of our souls, let us pray to the So again, we're, we're constantly inviting this stepping into a sacred place in a world that wants to separate you from that holiness. That's why a lot of us get bored in church. It's so foreign to us because we're so disconnected from our heart. Our heart is thirsting for that, for that reality, that space, that holy place. So when St. Uh, Theophon the Recluse says, a lot of times we're praying, we're praying from our head. And, 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 and I talk about this a lot where, you know, we think we're so cool in, in America because we've, um, you know, we have satellites and we go into the moon we just blew up you know the satellite the balloon that the white balloon that people are freaking out from russia or china and and we think we're so great we can go out into outer space and the lord is saying and i'm saying to you today you, you're going to get lost in space there hmm. there's there's actually a show lost in space when i was a kid um lost and we get lost in space and we're we're, we're very lost in this culture because we, we look for things outside to fill ourselves. And we don't fill ourselves with the things from within. We're going to turn to addiction. Anxiety is going to kill you or, or take you away. Depression is going to confuse you. You're going to feel so unworthy. All these things that are not true because your true nature is beautiful. And that's what prayer allows us to do is realize our true beauty in Christ. So instead of going into outer space, I talk about this 30 centimeter descent. You know how big 30 centimeters is? uh it's like about a foot that's good mr scientist <laughs> <laughs> about this big okay it's usually from your head to your heart mm. and when i talk about the 30 centimeter descent i talk about uh going into inner space not outer space anything that takes you into outer space you guys it, it's nice idea it's nice information but it's nothing for transformation it's good to know science and all that stuff but when you go to the inner space, that's where the, the Lord is going to open up this holy, sacred place that we talked about before. Maybe we can step into repentance because really mm -hmm. uh, prayer should lead us into a self-awareness of who we are, a, a true awareness. So when we say, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner, it doesn't mean that we're bad. You guys, when you talk about sinning, you're not that you're... It's not a bad word. It's a beautiful word because it invites us that we need to repent. And I want you guys to love to repent because you know what repentance means? Um, like in like an undoing or like a, an exiting from like a exiting sin. from undoing repentance. I want you guys to think of repentance as self-awareness hmm. that when we get far away from God, repentance means to reboot, reorient the inner world so you can how many people talk about the inner world to go to the inner world of the soul so we can have more life and life in abundance there uh you and i've been talking about repentance a lot recently and i'm wondering how does the jesus prayer kind of lead us into repentance 
Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. It slows us down so we can get rid of the noise, the lies that have been told about us, to maybe just listen to the silent voice of Jesus who tells us that we're, we're worth loving, mm. to tell us that the food of Netflix is not going to get us through life, that the drink of the next beer or alcohol is not going to cut it for you, that true repentance is, I want everyone to love that word because you're going to therapy for that word. And you're going to, therapy is going to be nice, you guys. But if it doesn't allow you to break through your, your mind to, to settle in your heart, then it just a nice, you know, it, it'll make your life a lot easier to the point where maybe you're doing yoga and you're going to therapy and you think, oh, my life's cool. And you have no, re no, no reference to our Lord. You have no, no connection to that deep sense of who Jesus is. And you feel like you, you're not going uh, to church because you're doing your meditation, you're doing your yoga, you're going on walks and you're taking care of your body. And then the Lord's saying, come here and worship with me in my house. And you say, I'm too busy. I'm too busy on your mountains. And I'm thinking, I want you to come home to his house so you can thank God for the mountains you have to ski on and the mountains you have to climb on and the breath you have to breathe. And until we realize that's the God we're praying to and with, it's just going to be a transactional thing. Oh, I did my, did you do your prayers? I did my prayers. Did you go to church? I went to church. I don't want you guys to go to church. I don't, I want you to love to come to worship a God who loves you. Mm -hmm. Don't go to church. Come to his house to worship him. Don't have it be a checkoff list. So here's what this really beautiful friend of mine, uh, Deacon John Tisa V says. He goes, repentance, check this out. Repentance becomes not a repellent magnification of our deformity. So when we come to confession, people want to tell me how crappy they are, how stupid they are, what sin they did, and how many people they went to bed with, and all these things. I mean, that's important, but we don't want to look at just your deformity. Okay, but repentance should be an attractive realization and reflection of God's beauty within you. Don't you want that? I want that, right? I want you to help me to want that. It's an inv invitation to, it's an invitation not to hopeless guilt. How many people come to confession and feel guilty? No, we got to let go of that stuff. And people say, you know, I, I had an abortion. I, I did this or that. I had an affair. And I can't, I can't forgive myself. I say, well, who's God? Who's God? Are you God? or God's the one that's going to forgive yourself. So you, you can't have forgiveness if you don't know how to forgive yourself. It's impossible. It doesn't work that way. So check this out. So it's not an invitation to hopeless guilt, but to freedom into true responsibility of being a human being. The purpose in confession, in repentance, is not that we be ashamed as though we that this was an end to itself. Demoralization is not the goal for confession, repentance. The aim in Repentance is true life, a life characterized by honesty, integrity, and a personal accountability in relationship to God. We are told by the Lord, do your best, go and sin no more. And then this is part of repentance, too, because what happens is we hide. We hide because in our relationship, it's hard to be honest. Here's the deal. In, 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 the, in, in paradise, we were created Two non-negotiable things, I'll leave with this. Two non-negotiable things. You can't be a human being, a Christian, whatever, unless these two things are met. Attachment and connection. There's a whole theory out there in psychology, attachment theory. We need to be know, we need to know that somebody loves us and we love somebody, that we're cared for, that we're we're understood, we're, we're listened to. If that doesn't happen, it makes being a human being very, very difficult. That's how it was in paradise with Adam and Eve and creation. There was this synergy. And the other thing is, that's non-negotiable, is authenticity. We are created to be truly who God created us to be. This is the powerful thing. When we're little babies, we live out of our instincts, right? We, we just, we, 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 we hurt, we cry. If we feel good, we smile, we laugh, we giggle. 
Um, we poop, we go pee, we just everything's naturally instinctual. And then as I learn to walk, I can walk straight into the street and not know it's bad until I have people like you, older people, my parents, guiding me with my instincts to guide me straight into the kingdom so I can respond to my instincts in a healthy way. So here's the deal. If I'm a kid and I want a cookie, I go, you know, Jordan, daddy, daddy, I want a cookie, I want a cookie. I ain't screaming, I want a cookie. And then, you know, you tell me, Tommy, good boys don't cry. And then, you know, I'm, what I'm hearing is boy who, boys who cry might not get dad's love. Mm. So if I'm thinking that and I want to be connected to you, what might I do? I might stop crying. I might stop mm. really wanting to, to be myself and want a cookie. So I have to negotiate two things. So here's the thing that traps us into sin. And this is where we have to really find a way to grapple with. Because I think this, these two things lead us into despair and disease and, and mental illness is what we do with authenticity and being connected to somebody. And if we have to give up one of those two things, we give up our authenticity. Mm -hmm. We end up lying so we can maintain our relationship with you. That's why there's so many affairs. We're afraid to tell people that, I don't know if I still love you and we're playing games and we can't say that because if I tell you, then you're gonna leave me. And that's what Adam and Eve did in the garden. They're afraid to tell God that they try to be like God without God. And again, what they did is they gave up their authenticity. They really lied to give the, the idea that I, I'm still going to be connected to God. Mm. But in reality, you disconnect it because you, you can't be an authentic and really be in a true relationship. It can be a pseudo relationship like that. So here's what we need. We need people like this. He goes, when I repent and I offer my peculiarity, my brokenness to someone who does not shame me, who will stand as a representative of the community and as a witness before God, then my healing can begin. When I take off the mask and together with at least one other person look clearly at my vulnerability, then my recovery and my repentance, my words, my repentance, recovery, restoration, restoration has begun. This of course is not easy. It's much easier to continue to hide. Repentance is a risk. It can be a painful process, much like bearing a child in the process. This will not be mortified. Rather, it is buried alive in a tomb that becomes a, a womb for a new life. So how do we practice knowing that there's a real God here in our midst now, Jordan, mm -hmm. that wants you and me to be in communion with each other, with him? And I'd like to encourage you, we can practice that. So just for for just follow me, if you can follow in your own, whoever's watching and follow my words if you can. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And when you do this, find a way to get comfortable. Take a deep breath. You don't know how to breathe very well. Exhale. Again, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And as you say this, you'll probably notice, oh my gosh, I, I'm running out of time. I have to go to this class. Try to get those thoughts out and allow yourself to stay focused on, Lord, Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Practice that five minutes a day during Lent. And with the grace of God, if you can increase it to 10 minutes a day, and then watch yourself during the day, I'd like for you to practice that, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, so we know that wherever we go, we're taking a test, uh, we're going to a dance, we're going to a movie, we're eating dinner, that the Lord is with us. So thank you for letting me share a few of my thoughts. And and um, and we need each other to support each other in prayer. So you want to close some prayer real quick? We can wrap up. Yes. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Lord, you promised that when two or three are gathered in your name, that you are present with us. May you teach us how to break the shackles of the noise of the world, to break the shackles of things that have bound us to believe lies about ourselves, that we may come to truly know ourselves as your beloved son and your beloved daughter. Give us the strength as we step into Lent, that we may love to come worship you, the one who gives the very life and breath that we leave, that, that we breathe. This we ask in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 
right. Thank you. Well, that does it for us today. Thank you so much for everyone watching. Thank you. God bless you guys.